Today on the Angry Catholic Show, we're going to tackle a culture of cover-up in the seminaries. Our angry item of the day is, if collection baskets could talk and save our seminarians. Welcome. You're listening to The Angry Catholic Show. I'm Paul the Angry Catholic with my wife, Chris, and Jean Gamulka. In 2013, a priest that my son served for was arrested in a car with a 15-year-old boy he found on Craigslist. It turns out my bishop knew this priest had predatory behavior problems for years. This past January, the music director of St. Nicholas Parish in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, was caught by text and video inviting what he thought was a minor boy to his house at midnight. As of today, our bishop has yet to inform parishioners. My wife Chris and I and a group of supporters started the Angry Catholic Show to discuss the continuing scandal as well as many other important issues facing the church today. If you're concerned with these issues, it's very important that you share this information with everyone. Don't assume people know because they don't. Most people have no idea what's going on in the church. So here we go. So I want to introduce Jean Gamulka, who was a retired Navy chaplain, an author, abuse victims advocate, and investigative reporter and screenwriter. He earned his B.A. in philosophy at St. Francis University in Loretta, Pennsylvania, and an STL from the Angelicum University in Rome. He served five years as an associate pastor in State College, Pennsylvania, and he entered active duty, active duty service in 1980 and retired with the rank of Navy captain in 2004. Now, St. John Paul II named Jean Gamolka a prelate of honor in 1999 with an honorific title of Monsignor after he and Dominican Father Thomas Doyle suffered reprisals in 2004 from then-Archbishop Edwin O'Brien for their work in exposing and combating clerical sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. And then Jean Gamolka retired after 24 years of active duty military service and took a leave of absence from the priesthood. So, Jean, we thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you, Paul. Now, you had written a report called Addressing the Present-Day Culture of Sexual Predation and Cover-Ups in U.S. Seminaries. And I'm just going to take right from the report. It's about, uh, well, the genesis of the report, you said, is twofold. Uh, One is a surging number of seminary officials across the country reported within the past decade alone to have abused their power and sexually exploited vulnerable seminarians and grave transgressions alleged to have been perpetrated by Cardinal Timothy Dolan and officials of the Pontifical North American College, referred to as NAC, in Rome against Anthony Gorgia, a former seminarian for the Archdiocese of New York at the NAC. And basically the report shows how the problems addressed in the lawsuit, which I'm sure you'll share with us a little bit about that, are not limited to the NAC, but have impacted and continue to affect a growing list of seminaries in the U.S. and around the world. So I, I, I guess to get us started, Gene, is, you know, this, you, you, had, you had told me when we talked a few days ago that there's been, I guess, three major reports similar to this. And I remember you saying about the, the, the very first report, which was done by Doyle, was ignored and covered up. So, you know, when you hear Catholics say, you know, they really didn't know, it, it's a bunch of garbage, isn't it? Well, most Catholics uh, are not aware of uh, <clears throat> Doyle's report because it, initially it was, uh, it was a confidential report. <clears throat> it's available now online on the Internet. But at the time, it was uh, distributed to the U.S. bishops in the Vatican, and basically uh, they covered it up, and after they covered it up, uh, they showed uh, Father Doyle the door of the Vatican Embassy. Mm. Mm. Wow. So uh, it, it began as a cover-up, this report. 
Now, um, I have a question just right out from the gate here. We've been told for years that the that Rome came over and did a visitation in the early 2000s, wasn't it? And in 2005 and, and 2006. Yeah, and supposedly cleaned up the seminaries because there was a problem, <laughs> but they just cleaned them up, right? And and yet, what's slowly coming out here, I guess, through lawsuits and through really brave seminarians and um, and priests and and people like you working to really reveal this and and bring it to light is that. Am I right in saying like there's a culture of like predation in the seminaries, and when these young men are in there, they they can be they're very vulnerable and, and they're kind of preyed upon. Am I being too um, over the top? Oh, no, with this? absolutely. You're you're right on target, uh, Chris. Um, and and I read uh, up until about um, about a year ago, I, I really had no idea how extensive. Uh, it continues to be. I, I, I was aware of the uh, the investigation in 2005 and 2006, and you have to understand the uh, the Vatican chose Archbishop Edwin O'Brien oh, to gosh. head that study. Now, remember, it was O'Brien who uh, got rid of both uh, Father Doyle and myself for reporting abuse. Wow. And and uh, so, in other words, it's, it's one of those examples of. Let's appoint someone to do this study who's going to whitewash it from the very, very, very beginning. Who should have been in the study. Like, he should have been studied. It well, wasn't. he was. I mean, <laughs> it was interesting, was uh, very interesting, because I, I mentioned this in, in my uh, report, that uh, at the time that he it was announced that he was chosen by the Vatican to head this study, uh, it was it, it was a, a month or two before that was announced that he was at a courage conference, which, uh, as you know, is is for those uh, for uh, people who are wrestling with same sex attraction. And at that conference, he attempted to recruit two gay men to enter the seminary and also then later to become military chaplains. So when they found out about him being chosen. And it was it what got their attention was that when when he was interviewed by the National Catholic Register, he told the reporter, "Well, people who are homosexual should never, never be accepted into the seminary." Well, of course, when they when they read that, they said, "What a fraud!" And then there, so there was an article they wrote exposing him for being a fraud in in saying one thing, but but really out to uh, whitewash the, the problem from the very get go. Wow, wow. Can you explain, because you said that um, you have people now talking to you and you're working on cases, and I, I think it's natural as, as you hear about seminarians being sexually harassed and preyed upon or priests, there is a part of you that thinks, well, I don't know, these are grown men, you know, maybe they should just say no and move on, but I don't think w we take a moment to step back and understand the vulnerable place that that seminarian or even honestly a priest is in being that like you, you, you have a vocation, like this isn't just a job that you studied at college to then do like a vocation is something more. And how does that make, I guess, a seminary or a priest kind of extra vulnerable? Well, he's very vulnerable uh, because he knows that if, if he reports uh, the abuse that he may have experienced himself, if he was harassed or what have you, uh, or if, if he reports abuse that he sees being perpetrated uh, on other of his uh, fellow seminarians, uh, he's basically uh, given an either he's told that either he has to keep quiet about this, and then he may be ordained, or if he, if he continues to, to speak up, uh, he will never be ordained, and, and that's happened to uh, again quite a number of, of people. Remember that the most uh, outstanding case here that goes back to uh, Buffalo involved Father Richard Biernat, who uh, was preyed upon by Father Art Smith when he was working in the parish with him, and it was Archbishop Auxiliary Bishop Grosch who told him, "Look, if if you report this, which again w w was a crime. I mean, if if you're you could be 21, 20, you could be 30 years old." 
But, you know, if you're assaulted, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a sex crime. Mm-hmm. And not only is it a sex crime for the person who, who tries to rape you or abuse you, but it's also a, a crime for those who fail to report it. So in, in this case, however, as we all know, uh, uh, Biernat kept his mouth shut, and he was ordained. Only later on, uh, when he reported Bishop Malone for covering up abuse, he was then suspended, and now he continues to remain a suspended priest. Now, w- one of the questions I wanted to just touch on, because this is, you know, this is what you've been working on literally for decades now, is you hear in the Catholic community and even beyond that many people think that it's a pedophile problem. And I'm not saying that there, there wasn't or isn't a pedophile problem, but, and, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the numbers from the reports, especially the one that the bishops paid for, I think if I'm right, it said around 82% of the sexual abuse occurred with post-pubescent boys. And if that's true, I can't help to think that, that this means most, I mean not all, but most of the sexual abuse was homosexual predation. And and we get into conversations with people with this. I just figured I'd, I'd get your opinion on that because I, I don't... I don't. Well, no, it, it's, it's not my, my opinion. It, 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 it's, it's a fact. What you said is, is absolutely uh, not open to opinions. It's, it is a fact. And uh, <clears throat> again, the, you see the bishops... Uh, do not want to acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, the febophilia and that the, the people who perpetrate uh, these crimes are, in, in fact, uh, homosexual predators. They go out of their way because without the argument, you see, is, is to say, well, there is no connection between uh, homosexuality and pedophilia. Well, to a degree, that's correct. However, again, as you point out, the church does not have a problem with a febophilia, a pedophilia. It has a problem with a febophilia, basically. And, and, and that is where, why uh, they, they try to confuse it by, by, by phrasing it along those lines. Well, and I think also because they're just trying to couch this as this is just simply a, a pedophilia problem and, and we have no tolerance for it, and, and I'm not even... I'm not even buying they have no tolerance for that, frankly, as we've seen. Yeah. But um, we see whether the abuse is occurring with a child who's um, prepubescent, like before they're going to puberty, the majority, you know, whether it's happening and the majority is really young men who are postpubescent. Um, but there's even, you, you have young women that are assaulted and groomed and taken advantage of as well who are young teenage girls, 13 or 14. I mean, there was just a case in Nashville of a 13-year-old girl. And really, there is one common thread through it all, and that is you have these bishops in our hierarchy, and you have people working in the chancery and people high up, and they all seem to not have this outrage over this behavior, and their first instinct is to cover. Well, it is, but that that's totally logical. Because you see, Chris, in many of these cases, uh, what people don't realize uh, is that a number of the bishops, at this point, because the majority of the bishops in the United States, the studies show, the majority of the bishops in the United States today have a homosexual orientation. Now, the orientation itself doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that they're going to be abusive, but in many cases, they are and were. Or in some cases, they're still sexually active. So they are far more inclined than a heterosexual bishop would be to uh, covering up this abuse. Because in also, there, in, in a number of these cases, because they themselves, when they were like on faculty members and so forth, when they groomed some of these priests who were being arrested or caught today, uh, they, they have a, a good reason to want to protect them because they are very much afraid that it may be disclosed that, that they were introduced to this lifestyle and to this behavior when they were in, in seminaries during their period of psychosexual development. And so that's why the bishops have to cover this up because they're afraid of being outed themselves. Well, even in the reporting, because I, I think it, in, in your report, 
the, the military specifically, because you were a, a Navy chaplain, they had in this, the John Jay report, they had reported, if I remember right, when we were talking, uh, two cases of abuse in the 50-year window that they had to report this for the John Jay study? Well, and, and of course, that's the biggest joke going. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's only a bigger joke than that. That's when uh, uh, Pope Francis, in his book, uh, In Heaven and Earth, uh, wrote that it never happened in his diocese at all. Oh, and yeah. Of course, there are uh, 2.7 million Catholics in the Buenos Aires diocese. So, uh, when Archbishop Edwin O'Brien reported too, uh, again that was uh, was a joke. Only insofar as uh, later on the uh, the John Jay study, you know, showed or the, not the John, but the BishopAccountability.org showed that during that time period they were able to identify just from news reports alone over 150 uh, people who were involved with the military archdiocese who were credibly accused of abuse. And that's why, when you look at, at that study, uh, the John Jay study, remember they reported that 4% of the American priests were guilty of, of, uh, of uh, abuse. But when you consider the fact that O'Brien identified just two priests, well, as you know, if there were 150 priests, and if you extrapolate that to about an average of, let's say, three ch uh, people being abused by that abuser, that would mean, technically, that you had about at least 500 victims of, 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 of sexual predation in the military during that time, and not two. Now, if, if they reported two and not, and not 500, you can understand why that 4% uh, percentage uh, point that the uh, John Jay study uh, uh, reported was totally, totally, you know, uh, underreported. Well, do, do you think that was just one, you know, the military was an, an outlier in that report, or do you think no, the entire thing no, was underreported? No, I don't reported? believe that at all. I, I, I believe, uh, I mean, when, when you look at other studies and uh, other, when these uh, various states, for, for example, Chicago or Illinois, when they did their study, they found, you know, like 500 priests that were never reported for abuse. Mm. So it, it, it happens in many, many dioceses. So, I mean, if you consider the fact that if I dealt in just two and a half years, and that I 10% of the priests that I was supervising in the military were caught involved, how is it that uh, uh, I had so many and then they had so few? And, and, and if I had five, how, how can uh, uh, Archbishop O'Brien report only two for 52 years when I had uh, five within just a, a short, within just the military, Marine Corps, uh, over that two and a half year period. So no, they, they lied. They basically lied. And and you got called on the carpet when they lied. <laughs> well, of course, I, I had a choice. In other words, if, if, if I kept quiet, that I'd be a bishop today. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's how it works. Remember, you have to understand what, 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 what your listeners have to understand is that, you know, when, when Tom Doyle reported that problem, uh, he was shown the door, but his successors, uh, who were uh, Dolan and Supich, are cardinals today. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, I'm going to give you the, the last words in this segment, and I want you to, uh, it's, it's from a Facebook quote. Uh, that we saw on your Facebook, and you wrote that seminarians are nothing more than young meat for gay rectors, faculty members, and bishops. They are. And I can, I can give you names. And you see, what's interesting about the young meat, a lot of these guys I, I talked to, if you look at their pictures, when, they were, when this happened, most of them were very handsome, good-looking young men. All right, you can listen to us on KCRD-FM, The Frontline TV, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Google Play, and Spotify, and find us, as always, at TheAngryCatholic.com. Send us an email to mail at TheAngryCatholic.com. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're back. You're listening to The Angry Catholic Show. 
I'm Paul the Angry Catholic with my wife Chris and Jean Gamolka. So for our angry item of the day, we came in with if collection baskets could talk. Now we took this directly. Uh, Jean Gamolka had written an article for Church Militant recently, and that was that was the title of it. If collection baskets could talk. Yeah, I thought it was great. And and right from the article. It, I'll just start with a quote. When scandalized Catholics learn how their contributions are being used to pay the salaries of credibly accused abusive priests to retain armies of lawyers who defend their predatory sex lives or even to fund clerical orgies, many parishioners vow never to give another dime to their bishops. And and this is the kind of stuff that infuriates me because most, most Catholics in the media won't touch this subject matter. And, and forget about the secular media, media, other than some headlines, we can't get them to touch anything. And, and then you have those Catholics that's even, that's even I think, even worse than not covering it, like Bill Donahue, that whenever any, anyone criticizes you know, anything that has to do with the church, and, and he and others like him, they go right to the defense, no matter the behavior that we're talking about it. So it's it's no wonder that these bad prelates continue to behave in this way and, and they never have to account for their actions unless, obviously, unless they're arrested. So, you know, and I'm sure you'll share with us how the outrageous amounts of our collection money goes in legal fees to defend this bad behavior. Catholics do not realize really how much of their money is is going to uh, to cover all this up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know Scranton Diocese of Scranton spends um, several million dollars every year on legal fees. Now, R- really, to at this point, it's to fight against justice for the very people that were victimized in this diocese. I'm. Um, I know certain Catholics have said, well, you have a right to representation and the church has a right to defend itself. And, you know, and and that sounds nice in theory. But at some point as Catholics, don't you have an obligation to stop all this nonsensical lawsuit stuff and just sit down and reveal the truth, whatever it costs you? I I mean, I I, don't we need to just stop all this. What do you think, Jean? (laughs) Well, they won't do it. For example, if you look at the Gorgia case, uh, Anthony Gorgia and his mom and dad, his, his father works for the police department of, of New York, so they're not like wealthy people. You know, for two years, they tried to get you know, the church to investigate you know, their allegations that their son was unjustly you know, separated and coerced into leaving, and uh, they, they got nowhere. And uh, basically, you know, Dolan and, and other bishops uh, who encountered these kind of situations, they simply believe that they'll go away. And, and if they don't, if they do sue, they'll just use the, the people's money. They have tons of money uh, and to, to throw at, at, at uh, these lawyers who will then uh, harass and uh, go after the victims and re-victimize them in the process, mm-hmm. hoping to bankrupt them and to have them leave because they can't can, can't afford this. In Anthony's case, the uh, the archdiocese uh, retained uh, one two law. There's two law firms that are going up against. One is Fox Rothschild, which employs over 950 lawyers, and then there's another law firm that employs over 900 lawyers, and and they're using church money, the people's money. To pay these lawyers over a thousand, some some cases over a thousand dollars an hour, to go after these poor victims who don't have a penny and who have to rely upon you know fundraising to be able to uh, to get justice. Well, and I think people need to realize they're not they're not employing all these lawyers and paying all these retainers and legal fees and everything to protect your church buildings to protect the patrimony of what your ancestors built. They're not doing it to keep your parish open because if they gave out all these settlements, we'd crumble. These bishops are going after victims using the attorneys and they are doing it and they're using your money and it's to protect their very own backsides because they have engaged in cover up and criminal behavior. Cardinal Dolan is just trying to protect himself because the man belongs in jail for covering up and looking the other way and not 
not protecting children, and it began in the di- Archdiocese of St. Louis. It did, and it continued uh, in, in, even before uh, he uh, uh, was uh, uh, an auxiliary bishop there, where he covered up the Dennis O'Leary case. Uh, and uh, then Milwaukee, I mean, there was a, a priest from Milwaukee who, who uh, emailed me. He said, if there's anything I am absolutely sure about in my life, there's one thing I'm absolutely certain about is that Timothy Dolan will burn in hell for the rest of his life. And, and these are quotes <laughs> uh, wow. from, from people. And you see, Dolan had to cover up for, uh, for Harmon and Park in Rome at the North American College, not just because he knew that, that they were engaging in homosexual behavior, but, but it was Harmon who was also accused of engaging in uh, anal sex with his bishop, uh, George Lucas, who was Timothy Dolan's very good friend from seven years in a seminary, four years in a high school seminary, and three years in, in a college seminary in St. Louis. So they're covering up for not just these priests, the predators, but they're covering up for, for their other you know, boyfriends and friends that uh, just has happened. He's, even when, remember, uh, uh, Grosh, who uh, covered up for uh, Father Adam, uh, for, uh, Father Smith, who, uh, who uh, abused, uh, assaulted uh, uh, Biernat in Buffalo, Biernat didn't realize that, that Smith and uh, Grosh were classmates in the seminary. So it's, it's all a matter of... of if of fighting, uh, covering up this abuse, and if they run out of money, they'll just sell another church. Yep. Well, and you know what? It's interesting you're saying this, Gene, because, for instance, Bishop Ambera, it, it's like he knew Father Polish had pr- instances of predatory behavior. He knew that he was not allowed on seminary grounds, Father Polish, the first year he was ordained. They didn't want him. They, they wanted him as a priest. They just didn't want him on seminary grounds because yeah. he was, you know, ad- acting in a predatory way with these seminarians. He, um, Father Polish took four leaves of absences, but they were classmates and they were ordained together. And that's what we're getting told is like, oh, they're classmates, they're ordained together. They're, you know, there's just such a bond. But I'm starting to think, no, this isn't a like fraternal bond or something that these bishops have. And this isn't, you know, when fellow priests and different monsignors have all these bonds. Because I know lots of guys and I know lots of guys in my family and no matter, and you could be frat brothers, but if you're sitting there, you know, raping someone, I don't think that, you know, your, your, your frat brother might not, you know, be as tight with you after yeah, that, a for goodness of, sake. Uh, um, I, you wonder, like, at, at some point, like, I wonder with Bishop Bambera, like, what was your deal, and why were you so close to Father Polish, and why have you allowed him to be in this diocese, and now we have another kid coming forward who said he was assaulted by Father Polish on his watch, on Bishop Bambera's watch. Like, why? Why is this happening? What skeletons in his closet? Well, again, you, you, if you trace these uh, events, you, you see oftentimes uh, the predator is also tied to the bishop. In other words, if, uh, when, <laughs> when Father weird. Harmon, who was engaged in, uh, was alleged to be engaged in the orgy in Springfield, he was ordained by uh, Bishop. Daniel Ryan, who was a known predator. And so you, you, what you find is hap, often happens, people like McCarrick could have uh, been involved in, in, in abusing people like uh, Adam Park, who then later on has been accused now of, of preying on seminarians. So it, 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 it's, it's what Richard Sipe said uh, in, in, uh, in, in all of his years of research. He said, this is all about passing the tradition on. Mm. Now, one of the things you touched on in your uh, article to Church Militant, and it's something that we've talked about many times, and it really hits home for our diocese because our bishop actually came out publicly. And I, I don't know if he thinks we're idiots or he just doesn't care, but he literally said, I mean, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but and I'm sure Chris will fix this if I, if I mess <laughs> if this you up. you butcher it. Right. But he literally said that not one dime of your collection monies 
will go to any of the you know the abuse settlements, um, the victims' compensation, the victims' compensation fund, fund uh, attorney, you know anything. He didn't. I don't think he that. didn't say attorneys' fees. He but, parsed but he, it. He, he made it like it was surrounding yeah, anything no, no, he, that has to do with the abuse it. scandal. Yeah. And and we know that's just a lie. It's it's not even. Well, it is. Possible. I mean, if you sell a church, wasn't that from the people's collection? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, there he said, we'll sell property. He's we'll lying. Sell property. Every dime He's came lying. in, other than the government money, every dime came in from people's money in the collection. But the church has a habit of doing this. I mean, the Peter's Pence collection, we used to give to that. We don't anymore. That was one of the ones we would do. And you're thinking, oh, we're giving to the poor. We're helping. And it turns out, no, it was like all these investments, like some apartment in London or like, like, like they just lie. And then they think, that you're not, I don't know, and then it, you feel like, you're made to feel like, oh, you're not faithful, you're questioning the wisdom or something. And it's like, this isn't the wisdom of the church, this is corruption, right? Well, it is. I mean, if that happened in, in, in the real world, I mean, if, if it were discovered that, for example, if, if an organization like the American Red Cross were known to have uh, taken all this money that was donated or whatever, the, the people who were in, in charge of, of these uh organizations and charities, they, they would be in jail today. But how is it that, that, that people like, like the, the, the Pope and the church can advertise a, a collection like Peter's Pence and then uh, misuse all that money and, and suffer absolutely no consequences? If you're concerned about these issues, it's very important for us to share this information. Chris and I, along with a group of supporters, publish this show and want to ask for your help by sharing it. Post it on social media, email it, text it, or just tell somebody about it. You can be sure if you don't, then nothing will change. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're back. You're listening to The Angry Catholic Show. I'm Paul, The Angry Catholic, with my wife, Chris, and Jean Gamolka. Now, for our final segment, we came in with Save Our Seminarians. And I want to go right to Jean on this one and tell us, what are you doing now to help change what's going on in the seminaries? Well, I'm doing a number of things. First of all, I've kept the bishops informed of, of my investigation, because I've been investigating uh, uh, the Gorgia case and, and all these other cases that have come along now for almost two years. And so I want them to know that they, they can't say later on, well, geez, we didn't know about that, like they said about McCarrick. Uh, so the first thing that I've been doing is uh, writing and publishing. And, and even the, the, the articles that I've published, like, for example, in uh, Church Militant or Crisis Magazine, those are designed to, uh, to try to keep you know, the faithful you know, informed. The only problem, though, is that uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the Catholics rely upon news services like Catholic News Agency or Catholic News Service for their input. And, and consequently, those uh, official Catholic you know, uh, news agencies uh, they're, they're, they're no, 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 more, no more honest than perhaps Pravda was, you know, during the Cold War and informing the Soviet people what was really going on. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Yeah, it's very sad. Isn't that sad? You, now, you said that you're informing the bishops, so you've put together reports, you're keeping the bishops informed. Are, are there any bishops quietly behind the scenes saying, keep, keep doing what you're doing, keep us informed? Or is it like crickets because they just... They're just not. No, there are some who who uh, have come out. For example, <clears throat> there are there, there are three uh, uh, ordinaries who wrote to the Apostolic Nuncio, uh, which I thought is a, was an absolute waste of time, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to in, inform him to ask uh, for the Vatican to investigate this matter. Of course, the Vatican doesn't want to investigate this. I mean, they they do not want to expose the problem because whenever. Uh, these matters are, are reported. For example, in 2005, in January of 2005, when Stephen Brady 
a Roman Catholic faithful informed the nuncio of the uh, the orgy in in the uh, in uh, bishop then bishop now archbishop then bishop uh, George Lucas's residence uh, in, in the presence of, of three seminarians and a number of mm. priests. Uh, the nuncio did nothing. You know, he basically sent it back down to Lucas and said, "Cover it up." Lucas got a uh, a defense lawyer and uh, had a report uh, published that basically uh, whitewashed everything and said it never took place. Mm. Wow. You know, I can't help so it. The, the, the problem oh. is, yeah, the, 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 these issues are are covered up, and uh, the, the Vatican, uh, if you uh, uh, send something to them, as those three bishops did uh, in, in this case, uh, the, the Vatican will absolutely do nothing. You know, and, and not only would they do nothing, but they will do everything in their power to cover it up. It's lay people and seminarians that have to speak up and, and priests like the, I, I well, mean, is see, that, the what's the answer here? Is, is that, you know, in, 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 in certain issues that come to light to the, to the national media get reported, but because this, most of these cases involving seminarians is, is one of homosexual predation. I think, you know, they, they, they don't want to offend, you know, members of the LGBTQ community and let it be known, you know, that, that these homosexual priests, you know, are preying on these seminarians. Uh, and, and that's why uh, we're getting such little coverage there. And, and, and also, even uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Catholic news agencies, uh, they covered up when, for example, in the case of uh, Father uh, Harmon, uh, who was being uh, relieved as, as the rector of the North Baron College in Rome, when the Catholic news agency reported on his uh, being stepping down, they ne- mentioned no one word in that article about uh, the lawsuit in which he's being sued in New York court or the fact that he was accused of engaging in anal sex with his bishop at an orgy back in 2004. So they, they, and also, neither, they also did not report the fact that when he took over as rector in 2016, <clears throat> there were 252 uh, students enrolled at NAC. Today, that number, now that he's leaving, has dropped down to 110, which represents a 56% decline in attendance. Now, if, if you were the, the, cor- the head of uh, McDonald's Corporation, and within five years, you know, 56% of all the McDonald's franchises closed throughout the world. I really doubt that you would be held as the greatest CEO in the history of McDonald's. Well, not to mention the fact, too, that it is, the again, the faithful people that are paying for these seminary educations so that priests can then be ordained. And we're doing it understanding that they're supposed to be friggin' chased, for goodness sake whether they're heterosexual well, or homosexual. My goodness. Well, you have to understand, <clears throat> that's not really the case. Yesterday, uh, there was an article which was published just recently on November 25th, and, and it involved a, uh, a, a Jesuit priest who, before he died, said the following, I quote, I would estimate that between 50 and 60% of the men who entered religious life with me were homosexuals who had no particular interest in the church, but who were using the celibacy requirement of the priesthood as a way of camouflaging the real reason for the fact that they would never marry, end of quote. So what's happening is, you know, there are a number of people who are entering the seminary today who really uh, are, are, are going there not because they feel they have a vocation, but it, it, it's a nice place to, to hide and, and to enjoy a very comfortable life. Well, Gene, Gene, one of the things that I don't understand, maybe you can help me understand it here, is in any other organization, and, and I don't know, it, it, maybe that's not any other organization, but in most other organizations out there, the sexual harassment that goes on is a is a big deal. 
whether and it's it, homosexual it, or heterosexual. Right. It, it doesn't for matter. Sake. I mean, obviously, in the seminaries and within the priesthood, it's going to be a homosexual harassment or predation or whatever. They're all men. Right. But I just right. I can't wrap my brain around it. And this is something we've brought up multiple times, and I just don't understand. No, or like the 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 secular media won't touch this. It, it's still harassment. It's still sexual harassment, no matter how you slice it. And I just don't understand why it's not a big deal because it's within the church. Well, again, it's 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 basically, I, I think, uh, it's a cover up. They they don't want to offend members of the LGBTQ community. The the the, the uh, newsman, a, a, a newscaster. Uh, <clears throat> Marvin uh, from Channel 11 in New York was re- ready to run our story because he was so convinced of everything that we had to, to say and report. But basically, uh, he was told to stand down that they did not want to offend the gay community. They knew it was homosexual predation. I mean, remember the the National Review Board, uh, most of those members resigned, uh, uh, Governor Keating resigned from the National Review Board mm-hmm. because he said, look, the, the bishops uh, want us to serve on this lay board, but they don't want us to reveal what, what's really going on. They want us to, to parrot their, their uh, excuse that, oh, the problem has nothing to do with homosexuality. It's all about clericalism. And because, the lay, because Keating and others uh, refused to lie, uh, they resigned. Sure. Well, and I just want to say, like, you know, I here I am a woman, and if you had at colleges an environment where female professors were getting sexually involved with their students who are like young men ages 20 to 24 or something, like, and, and that was brought to light, I, I, I shouldn't, like, I shouldn't be offended by that. I shouldn't feel insecure about that. Like, that's harassment. You're a teacher. You don't get to use your power to boink your student for but, goodness But sake. I would say that would be a big deal at the college level. That would get big attention. That would get big it, media it attention. Should. It, it should. would. I, I think it, it would. It's just so because I, it's within the church, I, it, it just I guess nothing. I, what I, I, you know, I guess I know people have different understandings about human sexuality, and there are people out there that um, think same-sex attraction is completely normal and okay. And, you know, obviously that's not the church's teaching, and, and it's something, you know, that I would be open to discussing with someone. It's not something I completely embrace, but I understand there's, you know, I'd be open to discussing and accept, like, we're not talking about that. We're talking about harassment. And I don't care if it's homosexual or if it's heterosexual. You you shouldn't have to have your, your, your groin grabbed, like, because exactly. you're getting an education. You're, you're abs- Chris, you're it's, absolutely it's right. It's transcendent. And this is why, interestingly, you know, one of our key witnesses in our upcoming case, if it goes to court, is a homosexual. He was a, he was a student at the North American College. He has submitted an affidavit. And his basic position is this. He said it's one thing, you know, if, 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 if two homosexuals who are adults, you know, they're, they're not, you know, not members of the church and so forth. If, 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 if they want to engage in that, that's, that's their business. But he says, he says, here's the problem: to have someone like uh, Father Park on the faculty, you know, trying preying on these uh, seminarians and basically saying, "Look, do this for me, or do that for me, or you'll never be ordained." He said, "That's that's criminal. That's that's predatory, you, and, and that should never never be allowed." So it's interesting. I find it very interesting that 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 distinction uh, between homosexual orientation and homosexual predation and homosexual behavior that 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 is being lost in this whole discussion. Absolutely, it is. Yeah. No. So, so, Gene, what what can the average Catholic do in in this fight? Like, what what can I they do? What, are there simple all, things they the, can do? The, I mean, if we're going to win this battle, because this, we're, we're going up against uh, an institution that's been hiding, you know, this problem for, for decades. Uh, but as long as they continue to be funded by the people, they'll continue to use their money and sell churches to, to pay more, to buy more lawyers, to pay, to, do, uh, to fight more lawsuits. So the people, the best thing they could do, really, is to try to help these seminarians 
who are who cannot win this in in church courts because Canada law is not going to come to their aid. They they the church is part of the cover up. So the only way they're going to get justice is going to be through the civil courts, and that takes money. And that's why if if if, if, if like at this Christmas time when people are used to giving. I think if if you Google, you know, save our seminarians, uh, uh, the save our seminarians fund. If if we can help fund, you know, th- this current court court case, if we can get this one through, it will set a legal precedent. It will settle. It will have as much of an impact as the Boston Globe had in you know 2002 when they broke this story. Yeah, because uh, I say all the time we have to support the people that are doing the heavy lifting. So I just want to clarify that, Gene. It's Save Our Seminarians. They can Google that and find how they can help donate. Exactly. Save Our Seminarians Fund. And if, like I say, if we can win this, this case, in other words, all these seminarians throughout the country who have been abused are watching this case. In other words, most people can't afford to sue. Because in most, uh, they're not, it's very difficult to find a lawyer who will take this on contingency. Sure. So, so right now we're only be, we're, we've only been able to go this far in this case because of the generosity of people. But it, actually, the gorges are are, are still almost like forty thousand dollars, you know, behind in, in legal uh, fees for this case, and they're poor. Sure. They don't have money, and so I mean. Uh, when people say we should uh, we, we should take this to court and not settle out of court, I agree with them. But the problem is to do that, you even need more money because they're going to throw more uh, lawyers at you because they do not want to go. I, I mentioned to the lawyer one time, I said, look, I studied with Dolan in Rome. I studied with Dolan, with Supich, with DiNardo. I even had Donald World next to me in a, in a seminar, you know, that I attended. But I said, in my opinion... Timothy Dolan will sell St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City on Fifth Avenue before he will be allow himself to be t- uh, drawn into court to testify. Because he's mm. hiding so much. So instead of giving your normal Christmas donation, instead of um, to your church, may- maybe the time to really help the church, this the church the that Jesus Christ or or, founded. Or if, if they don't, you know what's going to happen, Chris? Stand by. There's going to be more churches closing because, you see, there are going to be fewer and fewer and fewer, you know, seminarians. That's right. You know, the numbers are going down. The median age of priests in the United States today is 70. Wow. Wow. You know, and, and, and if you look at dioceses like Cincinnati that just announced how they're going to be closing more than half of their parishes within the next few years, and those parishes that they're not, that they are closing, what are they going to do with that? They're going to sell those churches and use that money to pay off these lawsuits. That's right, and not and not allow real justice to happen for victims right. and you of won't clerical get, abuse. And, and, and the problem is, what I find very interesting about the cases I'm involved in now, the majority of these seminarians that I'm dealing with that were were, were uh, abu- or abused or uh, reprised against were actually the very uh, incredibly bright ones. I mean, summa cum laude. We're talking, uh, Anthony Gorgia was the valedictorian of his class and, and got summa cum laude from his graduate school. I mean, these kids are, are smart. They're going after the good ones. And, and unfortunately, the, the, the ones who are docile or who keep their mouth shut or who are part of the homosexual culture and are being ordained, those are not the ones who uh, I think are, are going to be the great pastors of the future. Now, Gene, is there is there a link that I'll be able to put up in the show notes so people can just click to that and go directly on to that? Uh, yes, yes, there is. Uh, if, in other words, if you were to go Google like I'm doing right now, save our seminarians, uh, and if you Google that, uh, it's going to pull up Save Our Seminarians Fund, <clears throat> and that will take you right to uh, www dot gofundme dot com uh and that's uh save our seminarians fund so it's uh gofundme dot com forward slash and then it's save our seminarians fund so you yeah, have so, a link for everybody to yeah, do I'll, that. I'll, I'll put that right in the show notes that you can you can go on and click on that and help support 
uh, for these seminarians to, to get some sort of justice and to set a precedent that this, so other, this is going to stop. It, 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 it really does. It has to stop. Thank you for listening to The Angry Catholic Show. Send us an email to mail at theangrycatholic.com. Don't forget to share this show any way you can. I want to thank all the listeners who sent emails this week. Thank you, Chris. And a special thanks to Gene Gamulka. Stay active, stay alert, and stay angry. This has been a production of Dumb Ox Media Inc. All rights reserved.